Mashallah. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be upon all of you. Let me get myself a bit situated here. Find a bit of comfort. I want to be focused as I try to um, deliver a story of myself. Um, I am a PhD in myself, <laughs> so I think I'll do okay as long as I edit myself as I go. <laughs> okay, um, you know, I wanted to first start by sharing a prayer that I always recite before I speak publicly, which isn't often, but when I do, I turn to um, tools of the Quran. It helps us to focus bring ourselves back to our purpose, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, it is a piece of um, the chapter of um, Surah Taha, and it was a prayer that Moses had made to his Lord in his need. And so it, I'll say it in English. Um, it says, my Lord, expand for me my breast with assurance, and ease for me my task, and untie the knot from my tongue, that they may understand my speech. And I always find that if I start myself with that, everything just kind of unravels in a good way. And I feel content with what I've said as I've walked away from it. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, so I also wanted to share another um, little thing um, before I just go into talking about myself. And it, it's something that I think really relates to everything I'm about to say tonight. Um, there was a scholar in the 13th century in Syria, um, and his name was Ibn Cayman al-Jawzi. And he said this, he said, the only person who knows the reality of anything is someone who was in it and outside of it. And so when I heard that, it just really made me reflect on my own life because I was born into a family that was practicing as Catholics. And I was baptized in San Francisco. I was born and raised in the Bay Area. And <clears throat> my parents were not um, extremely religious, so there wasn't a lot of religion in the family, but they had belief in God. And we would go to Easter Sunday and um, we would attend church on Sundays. Um, and I remember as a very, very young girl, maybe the age of three or four, and it was an Easter Sunday, and I had my Easter basket, and inside of the basket there was a, a little, you know, the, the children version of the Bible. And I just remember thinking, I was so excited because I wanted to know God. And I don't know why I remember that, because there are probably a hundred other memories that I could have remembered from that time in my life. So I, I remember God as far back as I can remember being, and for that I am grateful. And I do think that has a lot to do with what, what we've all been created with, is the knowing of God. It's, it's, a, it's a, a fitra, which is what we call it in, in Arabic, it's, it's like the natural state of the human being. We all know God to some degree within our own self. And so I do believe that that's what started my path in, in my childhood. Um, and my childhood was a little bit haphazard, to be honest. I would lie if I told you it was the most beautiful, uh, carefree childhood. Um, my parents divorced when I was um, in second grade, and it turned my world upside down. Um, but I had these amazing grandparents uh, who really just kind of held me with all of their, their attention, their love, their presence. And so that were the wings that, you know, helped me to kind of grow. And, and I, I did grow up quicker than the average person by the age of 15. I had convinced my family that I was ready to move out and start my life. And um, it sounded crazy at the time. And I look back and I think it really was pretty crazy <laughs> if you think about it. But, you know, it was also a time in the Bay Area where you could do that. I was working. I started working at my family's restaurant. Um, when I was 13 and it was kind of out of necessity because not for making money to be honest it was more because my, my father worked there and so he had us on the weekends and so it was a way for him to spend time with us even though he was working and so his father 
uh, my grandfather, he and my grandmother, they opened Lucia's Italian restaurant in Fremont, California in 1977 when I was three years old. And, um, and by the time I turned 13 is when I started busing tables, cleaning up, helping the wait staff. And, um, and it was a really beautiful experience. You know, my grandparents were very generous people. They were the type of uh, restaurant owners where if there was a, a community member who was having a problem, they would do a, a spaghetti feed, you know, to raise money to help. Um, and, and so I grew up with that charitable kind of outlook on life. And it's something I'm grateful to this day because it's shaped my business. And it's one of the most important things that I take from my business is to be able to give, you know, to be able to feed. And I think that's just a really beautiful way to, to connect with people. Um, and so growing up in the restaurant, um, I, I, I guess the other part of the story is where my husband comes in. So <clears throat> he, is, um, he is born and raised in Pakistan. And he came to America at the age of 20. He's over there in the audience. <laughs> and so um, I, um, I met my husband at the restaurant when I was 10 years old. He had came to work for my family. And I didn't know him, but I remember seeing him. He took our order. And I remember exactly what I ordered. I ordered our raviolis and a side of a sauteed zucchini. That's what I ordered. And I don't know why I remember that he took my order, except for that maybe in those days, it wasn't as diverse. And I was about you know, 10, 11 years old, and so maybe my 10-year-old brain saw a face slightly different than what I had you know, become used to. And so we started working together. Well, pr previous to me working with him, uh, my, my brother started working with him. And my brother would come home and say, you know, Mush is this really cool guy who plays ball with me in the back on, you know, our break. And I'm, you know, 13 years old. So I'm like, oh, who's this Mush guy? You know, what are you talking about, right? And, um, and then I had the opportunity to start working with him when I was just about to be 16 years old. And we became, he was just a very, he was a friendly, gentle person. And I really enjoyed, you know, his workmanship. My grandparents, by that time, he had been working with us for six years, were considered him like a son, and my father as well. They very much really just loved and respected him, and he was always there to help out, you know, in anything that was needed. And so through my work with him, I developed a crush. <laughs> and I saw within my brain that this is like, it's hard to explain, but I was like, this is the person I'm going to marry. And I, you know, I look back to that time, and I don't really believe that it has anything to do with me. I don't believe that I, Lisa, just said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I really believe God put this in my heart, and this was the path for me to find Islam and to find the life that I've been living over the past 33 years. Um, and so he always says that he came to, to California from Pakistan, uh, to take care of me. And, uh, it, that wasn't his first goal when he came to America. His the goal was to help his family back in Pakistan. He's uh, one of nine, well, excuse me, he's the ninth of ten children. And so he wanted to help his family who came from humble, humble means. And so when I actually, we were, we were becoming very good friends, you know, working together a lot. And I said, well, what if we go out for dinner? You know, what if we have a movie together? And he said, well, I can't do that. We're not married. And I said, well, no, I know we're not. But so he said, well, you know, you have to talk to your dad, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's not going to be just that simple. You know, you can't just go out together. So he spoke to my father, and my father gave the blessing. And so we very quickly decided that we wanted to get married. And... It's one of those funny things where, if you know the American dream, everybody wants somebody to propose to them, right? But I was in a rush for some reason, and I know the reason it was for me to accept my faith. I truly believe that. And so I proposed to him. I said, what if we get married? What, what, like, why are, we, why are we even wasting time here? Like, let's just get married. And he said, well, you know, the thing is that I'm probably going to go bald, like, by the age of 30. And I said, well, I don't care. <laughs> I don't it doesn't bother me. And he said, and also, my, you know, I take care of my family. I, spend, I, I send a lot of money to my family in 
and I, I, I will always do that, so you would have to be okay with something like that. And I didn't have very much. And I said, well, that's, I don't mind. I, we do whatever we need to do. So he went back to Pakistan with my picture, because this is pre-iPhone or any type of internet, right? So he flies back home to Pakistan with my picture, tells my in-laws, okay, mom and dad, this is who I want to marry. And it's like a nightmare for any you know, parent in Pakistan whose son has moved all the way to America. And they come you know, home with the picture of this young girl, and oh my gosh. But then my sister-in-law had um, the best, um, the best idea, and she said, I'm going to pray a prayer of guidance and ask God for guidance, and then whatever the answer is, you know, we'll be at peace with it. And so she came back the next day, and she said that it came beautiful, and so she told her, you know, parents to like, just be at peace with it. And they did. They truly did. He came back to America, and we got married, and uh, traveled back to Pakistan to meet the family, and during that experience of me traveling back to Pakistan is where the story, and it took a while for me to get here, to Mirchi Cafe, my restaurant. So the first trip that I had taken to Pakistan, I was just 18 years old. I had uh, just decided I was going to enroll in culinary school. I had been working with my family from, you know, for five years in the restaurant, and I had fallen in love with uh, you know, this Pakistani man, and, I knew nothing of the culture, and there wasn't much available in the Bay Area in those days. So when I landed in Pakistan in Lahore, it was like an explosion of everything you can imagine and then some. And the most beautiful part of it was my, my family, my new family, were just standing there waiting to just accept me and give me a hug. And my mother-in-law grabbed my face and she said, um, she said, you're not my daughter-in-law. You're my daughter. And from that moment on, that's that's what I got, you know, the, the love and, and the respect and the caring, you know. So that just bursted my heart and even further, right? Um, and so on, on my wedding day, it was the day that I decided that I would also convert to Islam. And so that was 33 years ago. And, um, and it's really, again, as I started by saying, and the only person who knows the reality is one who has been in it and out of it. And so I've lived without it, and I've lived with it. And so I do really believe that I know that reality, and I'm grateful for it. And everything good, I know it's kind of cliche, but anything that you see good of me is from, from my faith. And anything you see that needs work, that's from me. <laughs> and I'm working hard. <laughs> I'm working hard. Um, and so, you know, imagine going to Pakistan at such a young age and being, you know, uh, interested in the culinary field. Not only had I not experienced, like, real Pakistani food, but I had also not experienced, like, continental food in Pakistan. So I ate a burger, um, and I ate a club, you know, you mentioned the club sandwich, so we, I'll, I'll tell that story. So we went to a restaurant called Shazam. It was back then very popular. It's still, it's still there, it's just not as popular as it used to be. And uh, I saw it on the menu, club sandwich, and I remember what a club sandwich is, right? Three layers of bread, some type of meat, some type of vegetable, usually some cheese in there. So that's what I ordered. And what I got was something very similar in look, but flavor was just immense. You know, the chicken breast was just popping with flavor, the fried egg, had like some of the special spice on it, so there was just this extra little tingle in your mouth, you know? And it just redefined what I understood food to be, you know? I realized like, this is food I'm comfortable with, but it's still different. And I would say that was the seed for my, for my business. I didn't know it, you know, in that moment, I didn't think I'm gonna open a restaurant that's gonna have this food. You know, I went back home and worked at my family's restaurant, and um, my grandfather passed away soon after I graduated culinary school. I went to the car, excuse me, I went to the culinary school in um, San Francisco. It's called the California Culinary Academy. It no longer exists, unfortunately. They made some poor choices, and uh, it's no longer in service. But it was an amazing school, and it was a two-year program. And I learned every aspect of uh, food, pastry, 
even butchery, um, running restaurants, table service, you know, the whole nine yards. And, and then went back to work for my family's restaurant uh, rather than go out and work for other restaurants because my grandfather had just passed away. And I just felt extremely um, connected to my family's business. Um, it was something that my husband and I had kind of grown up together in, in a way. You know, we grew into our marriage in that, in that restaurant. All the customers were very much like family to us. It was like a community restaurant. And they all knew us and they all, you know, at the very beginning when we were getting married, they were doubting. Like, oh my gosh, you guys are getting married? <laughs> you know, she's a little young. Are you like 18? So, yeah. And I said, no, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. And 33 years later, you know, we're, we're still showing them. <laughs> but, um, and so I worked um, on another level with my family's restaurant as I started managing. And that's the beauty of, of the story is because if I had just gone out and worked in restaurants outside of um, my family's restaurant and, and gotten into other kitchens, that would have been interesting too, right? I would have learned other cuisines and other ways. But um, running a restaurant from, from the managerial um, aspect gave me a completely different view, a different side of the restaurant that I hadn't really paid attention to when I was working the other aspects like waiting tables and, and cooking in the kitchen. Um, and so to, to manage the business um, was a completely new experience for me. And, uh, and my husband stepped in and, and we kind of tag team, you might say, we kind of did it together. And so um, a few years later, I felt like I needed to be challenged. And that's when I opened the catering business and I left my family's business. And, um, but then my parents, my, not my parents, but my grandfather and my grandmother, excuse me, let me rewind that. My uncle and my, by then my, my grandpa had passed away. My father had gone on to law enforcement. And my brother had also gone on to law enforcement. And my, um, my grandfather, I mean my grandmother and my uncle, excuse me, were left in the business and they called us and they said, we're really in need of your help. And I knew I couldn't do both because by then we had three children, three young children. So I had to make a decision between my catering and my family's business. And so I went back into the restaurant and sold my catering. And, um, and during that period I realized while I was working in it and the children were growing up and they started asking questions about what type of work we were doing. Because when I had left, they were so young that they weren't really connected to the kind of cuisine that we were selling. And I realized, you know, when my son was asking, you know, you sell wine and you sell, you sell pork items, and how does that, like, how does that work for us as Muslims, right? And so I had to really think twice about what I was doing because I realized, like, I have to live my values and I respect my family's values and I love them dearly. But at this point in my life, I had to kind of be at service for my family. And so we decided um, to let go of the business. And, um, and then at that point, I was in a period where for the first time there was a chance that there would be no restaurant in my life, no food service you know, of some sort. It's, I was three years old from the beginning, right? It was like destined to be in this business. Even my great-grandmother was a baker. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, Side note, she would sell angel food cakes during the, um, the Great Depression. So she would make the angel food cakes and my great grandfather, he would go around and you know, sell them. So I was destined to do this work, I'm sure of that. And, um, and so sitting around the family table, because by then some of my sister-in-laws had made their way to America. And um, so we spent a lot of time with family and uh, I was just throwing out this idea, hey, what about a restaurant if we were to, you know, have halal and we could do American food, but with a halal, you know, meat and we could, you know, do a little, you know, twist of, you know, the burgers like they are selling in Pakistan and everybody was just shaking their head. There was no such thing in that time. There really wasn't. And uh, most of most of all the halal food in America at that time was ethnic, you know, just solid ethnic food, beautiful food, but nothing to the degree of, you know, a comfort American food with, with this halal offering. And so everybody thought it would be really risky 
because the business is already very risky, right? Opening a restaurant, I think the first five years is like 90% failure rate. So it's, it's almost an impossibility, but, but it still happens. And so, but I'm a very determined person, as you can tell. I mean, I proposed to my husband, right? <laughs> so, and there's a side note to that as well, because for many years, I was really embarrassed, you know, because again, like everybody hears of the story of how the man gets on one knee and, and proposes, and I always felt a little bit embarrassed at it. I didn't get on one knee, but I proposed marriage, basically. But um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his wife, Khadija, may, it, may God be well pleased with her, she proposed marriage to the Prophet Muhammad. And when I learned that, you know, years into my knowledge of seeking knowledge, it just, it changed the whole perspective I had on, on my, my story, my love story. So I'm, I'm happy to have modeled, you know, a behavior that's, uh, that's very beloved and beautiful to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so, um, let's see, so we set out. I, 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 you know, I was very persistent, and my husband, God bless him, he's my investor. <laughs> that can be tricky because we live together, and, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot. But he's very patient, and, um, and we set out to find a location. We ended up going back to my catering business, and we, we bought it back from the person we sold it, uh, to and built the restaurant. It took about eight months, and in 19 or excuse me, 2004 in Fremont, um, Irvington District, we opened Reggie Cafe. And um, you know, back then it's funny because, um, like I said, we just didn't know what to expect. Number one, and a friend of ours, he had a, an acquaintance with Imran Khan, who is the Prime Minister of Pakistan. And, a lot of people know him through his cricket years as well. And he was just starting his political campaign. And so he asked him, hey, you know, my friend's opening this restaurant. Would you, would you come in and you know, be a part of that? So he came. And it was a really beautiful day. You know, I, I look back to that day and I, I was filled with you know, so much hope for the future of what this could potentially mean. Um, my intentions... Um, were really a to serve the community with halal quality halal food um, something that again was more of an american experience rather than a traditional cultural experience because i am italian american and so my islam is seen through my experience right um, community to model my grandparents and honor them and then also this was post 9 11 so uh, before i married my husband but like before before 9-11, uh, you know, where's your husband from? He's from Pakistan. Where's that? I don't know where Pakistan is. Post 9-11, Pakistan? Are you kidding me? Have you ever visited? Oh, this is scary. And so that was another intention to show the beauty of Pakistan through, you know, the culture of eating, of listening to the music, uh, as you're eating, tasting the flavors, but seeing a burger that you're very comfortable with, right? Something everybody's seen in America is a burger, but you can taste the flavors of Pakistan. So that was my bridge that I was trying to um, trying to build. Um, and so, you know, God, I do believe God really rewards you for your intentions. And I, I do know that my intentions were pure because they have definitely been rewarded. Um, we've been uh, in the community for 20 years, and um, it's hard to believe. It's really, I was 30 years old when we started the venture, and I'm now 50. Um, and so I'm, you know, I feel though as though I haven't yet even climbed a bit of the mountain. I, I'm still at the very base. <laughs> I never felt like I got anywhere, and I think that's good because it just means that I have enough passion, you know, to keep going and keep trying. I think once you reach a destination per se, if there's ever such a thing, you, you kind of lose interest. So I haven't gotten there yet. Um, and I'll tell you a story. Um, there's, uh, I was at a meeting about five years ago at the restaurant and some of the people I, I didn't know. And so after the meeting, a gentleman turned to me and he said, you know, I really want to thank you for opening the restaurant. And a lot of people say that, and I'm always flattered, and, you know, thank you so much. And he said, no, you, you have to understand something. He said, I was born and raised in Chicago 
to um, a family from, my parents were originally from Pakistan, and I didn't know where I fit. I didn't know if I was American, I didn't know if I was Pakistani, and I just struggled for many years with this identity. He said, but the minute I walked into the restaurant and I sat down and I saw the environment and I ate the food, in that moment I understood who I like was meant to be. And then I thought, wow, that's crazy. That's that's pretty exciting. Like that's really the fuel that keeps my passion going is, you know, touching the hearts of other people and that's that's my goal. And some days I, I hit the mark and other days, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I try my best. But um, but it was something really, really fun uh, to listen, you know, hear another perspective. And um, let's see, what else have I... You know, I, I feel like I've spoken so much. I do want to say one last thing, and then I, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Is that when I converted to Islam, um, my family really saw the religion as something foreign. But they embraced my experience. You know, they were happy for me. They were supportive. But they saw it as me becoming Pakistani. And I, you know, I didn't know it much myself in those years. I was so young. But if ever I could, you know, do it again, you might say, I would love them to know that this is a faith for all. It's not a foreign religion. You know, I have somewhat, I, I started wearing hijab uh, 10 years ago, so quite late into my, my uh, conversion, by my choice, I was the one who chose to wear it. And, um, and I was kind of struggling with, should I wear it, should I not wear it? And I asked one of my teachers, and I was making a video for Pakistan, to show the beauty of Pakistan, and I said, well, I'm making this video, do you think I should start wearing hijab, just like, you know, for the safety of being in a public eye, and you gotta feel more comfortable. And he said, don't do it for that. He said, if you do it for that, you're gonna take it off. So if you're gonna do this, do it for God. And that's, you know, over time, really what set in my heart. And then one day it just became like I had to, because I loved God so much. This is a public display of God's love. That's, that's basically what this is. And what happened when I took the hijab, because I had been, you know, looking like an average, typical American person for 40 years of my life. I could walk into any room and become anything. You know, like I wasn't identified as a Muslim. And so, um, but it, it sometimes it, it is a little difficult, but I'm not complaining about it because this is something I've chosen. But if there's any message like I would love to drive forward is that, you know, I met a woman a few years ago and I was talking to her about my past, kind of a little bit of the history I was telling you. And I could tell she wasn't really interested and I was okay with that because not everybody's interested, right? But it wasn't until I connected my father who she knew very well to me, then suddenly I became Lisa Lucia in her eyes again. And, and it was like so stark, like here's a person who is foreign, who I don't understand, and I'm like, this is Lisa from the Bay Area, like, <laughs> you know, this is Lisa Lucia, like, you know, I'm sure I'm Lisa Ahmad today, but I'm Lisa Lucia, this is it's who's inside of here, right? All the experiences that I experienced as a young girl, as a teenager, even growing up into my adult life, that's who I am. And I, I forget that people don't see that right away. You know, they immediately see something foreign. And, and I respect that. I, I, I think that we meet people where they are. And my job is not to, you know, it's not to fix it, but I'm happy to answer questions. You know, but it was a real stark moment. It's like, oh, I got my identity back. The minute she connected me to something that was comfortable for her, right? So I try to also look and be mindful when I see something that looks foreign to me, not to meet it with, with you know, with that understanding, trying to keep myself a little more open. So I, um, I would love if anybody had a question. I, yes, please. Hi. Thank you so much for your time. So interesting to hear your story. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs>
Yes, I feel you. I'm, I'm also nervous, so forgive me. I, <laughs> okay. I was curious, um, only to Washington. I don't mind, yeah. Uh, have you been to Zeppelin and, and to Boston? Yes. Yes, actually, we were there in December. Yes, and um, I'm grateful to say it's my was my fourth visit. Yeah, um, but I also waited until I was 40. And I think the first thing I thought when I finished the pilgrimage, uh, when I was, you know, in, in that year, I can't do the math in my head right now, but uh, 10 years ago, there we go. But um, I just remember thinking, oh, I didn't come soon enough. And these legs will not carry me forever. And, and physically, it was tiring. Um, and it was new. And I think the fear of not knowing, right, made it more tiring. And after, it felt as though if, 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 if you've ever experienced something where it was such a grand effort, and after it's over, you feel so peaceful. And that's, that's how I felt. Yes. And then after we went to Mecca, we went to Medina which is where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is buried. And it was very stark and different because Mecca is more like majestic. It's a very powerful feeling. There's a lot of high energy, and you feel that high energy. And it's sometimes overwhelming in a beautiful way, but overwhelming. And then you get to Medina, and it's like a cool breeze. And you just want to sit back and, you know, just enjoy that beautiful feeling. So that, that was the experience that, that I had from both Mecca and Medina. Thank you so much for your question. Anybody else? Um, so it's not like a good one. So I had a question. So how much time did it take uh, before your uh, restaurant became profitable? <laughs> profitable? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you, ask, <laughs> you can ask my husband over there. <laughs> get into the business? OK, well, I mean, um, okay, so the true answer is I'm not sure if we've ever been 100% ever profitable. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, and a lot of people see the success that we've had in 20 years. Um, but here's the thing. My business is a, a passion business. So what I mean by that is I don't cut corners to make profit. So things are extremely expensive right now, and in, in any level-headed business owner would start to cut, cut, cut as much as you can to stop any bleeding. But because I've devoted myself to this business, honestly, for the sake of the community and for the sake of my love of what I do, my husband is my investor, um, and he's the one who fills the gaps when they're needed. I always joke that he's, you know, he's the guy who's subsidizing the halal burger scene. <laughs> Muslim community. But here's another part of the story if you want to endeavor into opening a business, a uh, restaurant business. The first thing is like really truly do your homework, meaning that you know exactly how to do every single job, that and you know exactly how to cook every single thing that you're cooking, and you know how to do all of the service of the business. You know, you know how to do all of it first. Because if you hire people to do it for you, you're not going to be able to manage them correctly, right, if you don't know the job yourself. Secondly, find a very inexpensive lease, if that even exists anymore, because the overhead, this is a very simple approach to business, restaurant business. 30% is food cost of, of your total, right? 30% is labor. And in today's world, it's really hard to keep it in 30%. We're like at 40% right now because it's like between 20 and $25 per hour per person. So just, you know, if you add that up, it's just, it's really hard. Um, but, you know, we believe in fair wages. So there's that too. Um, and then this, this remaining, right, 40% is like your overhead. It's every fixed cost and insurance and taxes. So it's really like a business where you're saving pennies to to make you're saving pennies to make money. It's it's not an easy business. And 
no fool would ever, you know, it's like some days I think I'm very foolish to be doing this. You know? It was very physically painful too, you know. I got slip discs and bad back and we lift heavy things. It's very stressful. There's a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And the minute you fix one problem, then there's another problem. And then 10 problems after that. And you never find, you know, you never find like you're at the top. But if you are passionate, you really believe in the work, you really love what you're doing, connecting to your customers, you know, then it's worth it. Then I say absolutely go for it. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'm really inspired by your story here. Okay, Give me your last answer. What made you decide to expand? And um, when you decided to expand, what made you choose something? Sure. Well, um, the truth is I didn't want to expand. <laughs> My husband here, he, he thought there was great potential in the Dublin community. A lot of our customers were begging us, please open in the valley, please open in, you know, maybe Dublin. I just knew that I'm only one person, and I cannot ever be in more than one place at one time. So for me, it just seemed like a no-win situation, you know. Um, but we found a good lease, and I'm a dreamer too, right? So I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. And why did I pick Dublin? Um, honestly, it started with the good lease, I'm not gonna lie, because you can't afford just to open up anywhere, right? And, uh, but secondly, I grew up between, I grew up in San Leandro, Hayward, and Fremont, but the valley was where my cousins lived, and so I have a lot of fond memories. Uh, so it's like all a part of, you know, my childhood. And so it felt very comfortable. And my brother lives in Dublin, so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I know we're coming up to time. A few more minutes, right? So... I watch shows like Kitchen Nightmares with Gordon Ramsay, and I see this very high energy person, uh -huh. and I see you as very like there's serenity here. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm just curious, like uh, you know, I'm expecting the shorter book, who's like who did all of the things, and you've got this like gourmet chef kind of let the let the beans marinate with all the things up. You know, it's going going for you. Where did you get that from? Well, no, I mean I. That's a good, I, I don't know that I always exude this energy. I'm sure if you ask my family, they have another story to tell, right? Nobody's perfect. Um, but I'm not a line cook mentality. So like in the restaurant industry, there's different like slots that we all have to fill and every one of them is important. So I'm not a good line cook because I don't like to do the same thing every day, you know, like, Repetition that makes my 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 OCD brain crazy. Like I want change, and so I'm more creative. And so I think the creativity is what you are sensing. So that's where I fill the space in my business at this point, where I'm always looking for the quality control. I'm always looking for the problems to solve, and I have to do that in a very calm manner because if I approach my staff up here they're not going to listen, you know, they're just going to shut down and, and then we're going to get nowhere, right? So I've learned over the years, like, you just have to really bring it down inside yourself, like, process it first here, <laughs> you know, and then formulate, how am I going to approach this problem and get myself heard? And, and I'll be honest, I'm a woman on top of it. And that's tough sometimes. And I don't mean to sit and play that fiddle. But, you know, if I was this angry person in the kitchen with my staff, then I'd be labeled, you know, the angry woman, right? And it's really different when, when the man comes in and he's powerful, right? I'm angry and they're powerful. And so I've also learned how to kind of use my femininity to, you know, kind of finagle <laughs> people in a way that they can hopefully honor and understand, right? Like, this is important. We need to get this done. So, rather than forcefully demanding it, you know. Yes, please. Okay, so I'm ready for the So, um, that was a lovely, beautiful, inspiring story. I mean, thank you. And you mentioned that you 
you wanted to know in your early uh, age, you wanted to know about God. Mm -hmm. Yes. And knowing God or finding God is a journey. Yes. So when did you feel that you had found God? And what inspired you when you get to work with it? Well, when I know. Most, like from the sound, what, what was the most inspiring thing that you found? For sure. Um, so, when did I truly know God? I feel like I always did, and I, you know, as a young girl, I would I would pray in my own understanding of what prayer looked like it in my bed. You know, um, I would talk to him, and I look back at that little person, and I just want to give her a hug. <laughs> you know, because I didn't have any tools. I was just doing what was innately, you know, natural to me. And so I'm grateful for that. I don't take any ownership to that. I don't know why he picked me. You know, I don't. I just don't. Because I know there's a lot of my beautiful, beautiful friends of mine who struggle with understanding, you know, the connection with being close to God. Interestingly enough, my name, Lisa, is from Elizabeth, and it means close to God which I didn't know until I converted and everyone said you have to change your name to a Muslim name but then I found out no I don't if it's a good meaning I can keep my name <laughs> and I think close to God is a, an amazing name so I'm keeping it <laughs> um, the other question you asked was uh, what inspired me and the honest truth and sometimes it's not as like easy to package but it was love of my husband it really was the catalyst that that brought me into Islam. That's the truth. I was very interested because I was in high school at that point and I was in history class and they were teaching about the history of Islam. And I was like, I know a Muslim. I work with him. And so I would ask him some questions. And he was like, you know, laid back, cool guy, you know. <laughs> so that's the truth. You know, it's not the stories that, you know, is sometimes the story is not as straightforward. It, it really came through love of a person, and I see that Allah did that because he knew me better than I know myself, and he knew how to grab me. He knew what I needed, and he gave me that, and then he allowed my heart to open because he also knew me well that I'm a very soft person, like my heart gets hurt easily, so he gave me in-laws who were so soft and so loving and, and not judgmental. You know, I didn't come in, you know, into the religion looking like this, right? I look like Lisa Lucia, who was born and raised in the Bay Area to, you know, American family, which is it's fine. It's a beautiful thing. But I didn't have any knowledge you know, at all. I remember going to Pakistan the first time when somebody said, like, oh, don't put your feet on the table. There's food. Now, I wasn't doing that, thank God. But in a moment, I was like, well, as an American, like, we just go home and we, like, put our feet up, right? And then there's food there. But they honored the food so much that it was a huge no-no. Or if somebody wanted a glass of water, and they didn't just pick up, like, in my home, we just, here, here's the water, right? And again, no disrespect. But in, in, in the Islamic world, they honor it. It's on a beautiful tray, right? And I witnessed those things as a young girl, an 18-year-old girl. And, and that opened up my heart to the beauty, right? And it's the simple things that pierce the heart. It, you, can't, you can't pierce the heart with the deep stuff right away because the heart's just, you know, doesn't know how to take it in. You have to start with the little things that are, you know, your day-to-day -day stuff. So those are the things that, like, started to open up my heart. And I met my nieces in Lahore, and we were very close in age because, like I said, my husband's the ninth child, so he has a lot of siblings who are much older than him. So they had children who were close to my age. And they were very different than myself, but we were close to an age. And they were very, they were very pious. That's the best way I can describe them. In a beautiful way, they're just very beautiful, pious people. And, and I just like, was attracted to that. It was just beautiful. You know, so it was little by little, and the beauty of it was it was not forced down my throat. Nobody told me what to wear. Nobody told me how to do anything. They just accepted me for where I was at, and that allowed me to take my experience, you know, at my own pace, right? Because when we force things down people's throats, usually they, you know, fight back. 
And so, so that was, yeah, I hope that answers the question. You get to hear more from me again. Oh, it's First true. of all, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. As a part of the White Road community, we really appreciate it. Everybody here. Thank you. But it reminded me of something when my adopted mother, Alpha Carlton, one of the third men of the restaurant, we used to say 56 years ago. Yes. But one thing that changes people's attitude is food. And yes. what I love was listening to you not asking religious questions as much as they want to know about the restaurant. Yes, yes. Why you open it why you expand it. Right. Is so there anything that really helps with the commonality is these experiences you share because they're not shown personally. That's right. I agree with you 100%. And I think that is the bridge, right? That is what we're all working towards doing here is to get to know one another, to share our experiences. This is just my small story. This is what, you know, ultimately we all have a story of God in our heart. You know, we all sit here together and we share that and that, you know, it's just to me the most beautiful, special thing that we can do with each other. So thank you all. I'm embarrassed to even talk about myself. <laughs> so thank you so much for welcoming me into your community. I, I hope to see you. <laughs>